Thanks for joining us today. I'm Jeremy Onisco, Program Manager for BTW Inform. Contractors use BTW Inform across a wide range of use cases to replace paper forms, collect better data, and report on that data. Today, Cole Tweehouse is with us to dive into some real-world examples at Tweehouse Excavating. Cole, welcome to uh, the show here, so to speak, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, thank you for having me today, Jeremy. It's uh, glad to be here and excited to get to talk about all the cool features PTW Inform has to offer. All right, terrific. I wanted to kind of think back to the, the getting started phase for BTW Inform with Twee House. So thinking back to 2018 when uh, Twee House started, Twee House actually being started with BTW Inform, uh, five licenses at the time, I, I was hoping that maybe you could share a, uh, a couple of notes here to kind of talk about what some of the more traditional based processes and workflows look like at the organization prior to, again, your adoption of, uh, of BTW Inform for safety, reporting, and inspections? Sure. Prior to BTW Inform, um, we, like many other companies, were using paper-based uh, recording and inspections. Mm -hmm. Those were field implemented, paper, binders, uh, if, if you know, we're being very general with it, uh, the, the paper was pretty inefficient. Uh, the getting filled out aspect was never known. You weren't, you weren't knowing if the uh, responsible parties were even beginning their paperwork and filling them out. And it was inefficient from an office standpoint, having to collect all the papers from the fields, regardless of what the topic was and having to double handle all of that information, a lot of times it would get lost. Um, so with uh, B2W in 2018, uh, we bought five licenses, started out pretty small because we weren't sure how we wanted to implement Inform. And uh, looking back, we, we really had no idea what all Inform had to offer for us. So um, I got my hands involved with designing templates and reports in 2018. Um, with your help, I've been able to grow our tenant uh, significantly, and it has been quite the tool. Uh, we, we're probably just scratching the surface as far as what Inform has to offer, but it has been very, very helpful for our topic today on safety, inspection, and reporting. Perfect. And I, I do remember back uh, a couple of years when we got started with some safety, and kind of to take a look at what your, your tenant looks like now for you know, our uh, attendees here in, in a snapshot. Uh, we're looking at 27 templates, 2,700 forms completed, 40 plus reports, uh, several of which you've got running uh, weekly here. But, but that's really just a quick snapshot and some data points. So as you and I had been kind of talking and, and working together more recently, I know that you've got a lot of these kind of use cases that date back to you know, the very first and an early adoption of Inform, but now you're starting to roll the product out to many different new sorts of use cases. So maybe uh, you could just pick a couple from this list, maybe a few of the more recent ones, and uh, just share a few thoughts with me. So as far as the forms we have uh, in front of us here, um, we started with equipment inspection reports, um, service inspections, uh, hours, miles, uh, this was a huge time killer in the field, um, filling out paper for every single one of our pieces of equipment every single week. And it was a really good form to get our hands in uh, right off the get-go and, and learn um, the ins and outs of the Inform template building process. Um, it's probably our most used form at the moment just because of how much equipment we run on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, Moving on from the equipment service inspections and reports, uh, we've kind of branched off into our safety um, and site, I guess, safety and site work inspections, um, employee disciplinary and payroll yeah. templates, um, inspection forms for quarries and, and unfortunately incidents we try to stay with incidents, but there is a need to investigate them and report on that information. And Inform has been very helpful with that. 
Excellent. Well, you touched on a couple of these, and they're actually going to be part of our use case that we're going to dig into. So uh, appreciate kind of the, uh, the feedback on a few of these others uh, that we won't have time to dig into. But for kind of the, the purpose and the topic today, uh, I am going to take you through in, in the slightly uh, deeper level here a couple of these use cases here, starting with confined space entry permits. So for those of you that are attending today and that are unfamiliar, uh, Cole, what's a confined space entry permit? So a confined entry space permit is an OSHA required permit. Uh, anytime you're entering uh, a self-defined uh, confined space, um, any type of tight space that um, you could be trapped in, uh, you could fall into, um, you could enter a space, have um, gases that would affect your health. And it's, it's a very important piece of what we do as far as paperwork. Um, OSHA, OSHA is levying quite significant fines for not filling this paperwork out when you're supposed to and how you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So from a field standpoint, um, this one is very important. Um, it's, it's essential anytime we get in a hole and, and do work where this is required. So, And I presume this is something that you were working on paper-based copies before, meaning in terms of accountability and tracking who has or has not completed you know, a confined space entry permit before the work began, that, without putting words in your mouth, was, was definitely a challenge, I would presume, right? That's correct. We go into certain projects knowing we will have to enter confined space. And um, you know, in the years past, we would go back mm -hmm. and our safety manager would try to pull records from certain projects where we knew we had confined space work. And those yeah. records were incomplete or missing altogether. And it leaves you wondering back in 2012, so someone was in this hole, who was it? We have to provide these records. And, and this is where INFORM and confined space entry permits kind of came about. So. And do you recall, was it yourself or was it someone else who worked on the design here? Uh, I've, I've got a couple of these screenshots of our template design up here. Uh, was this um, one of the earlier projects that you started with in BTW INFORM or was that the, it was probably the equipment as I'm thinking about it now, right? From a this was probably the second form created after the equipment service reports. It, it was our first uh, dive into tables and yeah. uh, checklists and, right. and all those good components. Right. Okay. So for those of you that are uh, kind of following along here, what I am displaying here on this uh, slide and Cole speaking to is uh, it's called what's the template design here for these forms. So uh, where we're auto populating or we're leveraging checklists or uh, we're utilizing e-signatures, right? We're, we're helping you know, the end user right, complete their form fast, efficiently, and most importantly, correctly. So um, again, just as a quick aside for those that are paying attention and haven't seen maybe BTW Inform, that's what this uh, template design looks like. So uh, that being said, let's, uh, let's talk about reports just for a moment here. So you made a good point, which was, Let's say that you have the need to query for a record or a form that was completed years prior, weeks or months prior, really doesn't matter. Uh, you had mentioned that that sort of a process can be, I mean, more than just a challenge if you're trying to find records that are in some sort of a filing cabinet or a box that may not exist anymore. So uh, with respect to reporting in B2W Inform, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, we do support an enterprise level reporting engine inside the product that allows you to do all sorts of things. And, and what I've got here is your confined space entry permit report. And talk to me about how the data is grouped here and, and what's useful about the report for you, Cole. So in addition to the um, confined space templates and forms that we fill out, this is the back end product, so to speak, um, on the confined space entry permit report. This is this is hand down one hands down one of the uh, most useful tools for our safety manager from a reporting standpoint. He can go back and look at all of these uh, confined confined space entry permits that have been filled out, 
And that goes back to the um, created on um, the auto populate box, the created by auto populate box, um, and all the other data fields that we can tell this report to pull from and report on. Um, with a couple of simple clicks, he can have a report and pull every confined space or entry permit that was created in a set year, say 2020, and he can tell what we're doing, who was doing it, and where we were doing it, and associated hazards. We can tell this report to do anything that we want it to do, and with a couple of clicks, he just saved himself countless minutes trying to pull from all the different job files and folders uh, to, to get this one page of information that you see here. Making uh, data easily accessible, that's, uh, that's the power of reports. So uh, transitioning here into a slightly different use case, utility damage incident forms. Um, again, for those of you that are uh, joining us here today, I've, I've got a couple of screenshots here of what the template design looks like for these uh, underground utility damage incident report forms. Um, so from a uh, kind of a design standpoint here, we're, we're seeing that Tui House Excavating is enforcing a lot of kind of standard approaches here to their designs. Uh, so wherever possible, you know, leveraging pick lists, uh, we're seeing that real-time lists of employees are being fed from your operational suite database. Uh, you know, rich media uploads uh, to be able to take multiple photos and attach that to a form. But uh, maybe you can just outside of the design standpoint, maybe talk to me about utility damage incident forms as, uh, as your organization works with them. So like, like any uh, earthwork contract, utility damage is something that we try to stay away from sure. uh, when possible. We can do everything that we physically can to avoid utility damage, um, but sometimes it does happen. Stuff gets unmarked, um, stuff that's that nobody knows about is in the ground. And um, from a insurance standpoint and a safety standpoint, we have to report on this accurately because there is always a cost associated with a uh, utility damage, mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of whose fault it was. Um, so we put together this template, to kind of track all of the, uh, the key points in a utility damage incident, um, where it was hit, who, was responsible for the project and who was responsible for the hit or the damage. Um, you know, what type of work were we doing while we damaged this utility? Um, was it avoidable? Was it our fault? Was it uh, the locator's fault? Did he not mark it or did he not know it was there? Um, using the setup that we have uh, in front of us, we can present the the inspector, which generally is our safety manager, comes out on site to fill these out. We present him with all of the information that he could be um, trying to compile. We don't we don't leave any guesswork with this form. You're going to see that it's it's pretty all inclusive as far as uh, root causes and type of utility. Um, these drop down boxes are extremely helpful. Um, as far as say the employee who hit the utility that pulls directly from our uh, database, as long as we're keeping the utility or the uh, employees updated in the system, inform is going to keep us updated. So, um, filling out the utility damage form, um, you can see there's a media box uh, to upload photos, and that's been super helpful. Um, it doesn't take up much space on the page, as you see, but um, if our, if our incident is uh, serious enough to warrant uh, multiple pages of pictures, we have the ability to add those and um, it doesn't affect the use of our form since it adds all the photos to the uh, appendix page. Mm -hmm. um, that's super handy when you're trying to distribute these uh, to upper management and uh, trying to diagnose problem. You can keep all of your media in one spot, so. Yeah, absolutely and reporting. So in this particular report design, uh, we're leveraging one of these uh, hyperlink formula functions. And you can see that down the right hand side here in this form ID column. So 
you know, we had talked in the last report example for confined space entry permits, uh, how easy it is for your safety director to get at a specific form by just knowing a couple pieces of information. Maybe it's, uh, it's a date or it's the name of the individual who completed it or what have you. Um, one of the other tools that, that we like to help you work into your reports is being able to link directly to those forms themselves. Uh, so that you running the report ad hoc can click on the link, open the form up, and it's easily available for download, sharing, that sort of thing. Uh, but also for external sharing. So to download this as a, as a PDF and, and send it off, uh, you find that it's an easy report to work with in terms of uh, being able to work backwards to find one of these uh, underground damage report forms. It's extremely easy to work with. I'm glad you just said that yeah. because um, I was going to say, if you take my example um, that I used earlier um, and look at it from this standpoint, you are working backwards. You have at the click of a button, all of your reports in front of you. And if you need more granular information um, about that incident or permit or, or whatever you're using, you go um, to the form ID link and you can pull it up just like you'd build it out. And that really saves so much time um, when it comes to needing more information that this report um, isn't set up to provide. Um, that working backwards in a sense, uh, yeah. you've got your information in front of you, you know where to go to get the, the rest of it. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And you know, this is just one example of the many different ways that we could have helped you design this report, but uh, for those that are uh, attending us here today, we're looking at you know employee who hit the utility type of work being performed in root causes, but all of those data fields we saw in the template, those can be pulled in and reports can be designed around those as well. So you're not really limited to the ability to report on just a couple of different component types. Uh, you know, Cole, if your safety director came to you and said, look, I'm really only interested in, in root causes and the name of the employee and a date, uh, how fast do you think you could turn around that report based on what you already have? Based on what we already have, um, you go in, uncheck a couple boxes and check a couple more and, and you can spit out a report in no time. It's that easy. All right. there, there's your report. So. Okay, uh, transitioning away from confined space, uh, utilities, uh, talk to me about quarry inspection forms. And, and I'm thinking that this is probably a type of form that has some pretty heavy kind of regulatory um, responsibilities around it. Well, you would be correct. Um, and I'm, I'm not too informed on the dates that all of this was implemented, but MSHA has started to require um, inspections mm -hmm. from the people who are working in the quarry. And that isn't just the owners of the quarry or the managers of the quarry. If, if you come into a quarry to do a piece of work, um, whatever that may be, um, even if you're just dropping off of a piece of equipment, say that we hauled into the job, uh, they're gonna require you to do an inspection in your immediate work area. Um, and, and if that inspection doesn't get done and something were to happen and MSHA inspector comes on site, um, that's, that's an accountability thing just because the um, quarry manager, say, had filled out his inspection for the day, you were working in a different spot um, and he didn't inspect that area, they're gonna require that inspection from you. So with this short little form that we've generated, uh, we've been able to satisfy all the requirements for that EMSHA required inspection, and it really takes no time. Uh, these these inspections are usually something you basically open, check boxes, and sign your name to just to say that you have done it. Mm -hmm. um, but the inspection uh, was made as short and sweet as possible. You see the auto populate boxes here. Um, there's no I created or I made this on this day, it does that for you. Mm -hmm. The uh, auto-populate with the form ID, uh, who created it and where in the metadata. Um, it's, all, it's all entries that don't have to happen manually. And that, that really is important when it, when it comes to saving time in the field. Uh, we like to say that 
every click is wasted seconds. So if you can save those clicks, uh, sure. you are saving time in the long run. Sure. What do you think? Just uh, ballpark here. How do you? How long do you think it would take to fill out this form using the B2W Inform mobile application? Using the mobile app, if you were familiar with it, I would say no more than thirty seconds. If sure. if you can open, check your areas that you know you've inspected, mm -hmm. and there were no deficiencies. I mean, the, if if there were deficiencies mm -hmm. and you needed to correct something, the typing would be the the longest right. portion of that form filling. So then really no excuses for not completing it. Uh, that, that's the way I would look at it, but. Absolutely no excuses, yeah. No excuses, all right. So kind of along the similar lines that we had with uh, reporting for utilities and confined space, uh, this is another example of a report where we've organized it in a very specific manner so that we're really just kind of giving the highlight points, if you will, uh, from those forms and then sorting them by a specific field, whether that's a form ID or a created date. Uh, we've already kind of hit home on a lot of the, uh, the talking points, I think, so far with um, how beneficial a report layout like this is. So uh, unless you have anything specific, we can jump into the next next use case. Um, one thing I would mention on this report, and I don't think that it ever happens, but if an MSHA inspector were to come on site and say he knew he'd, that we had been working here for the past two months, I'm thinking he has the authority to tell us he wants to see the last two months of inspections. And with this report, you select your date range that you'd like to report right. on. It, you know, click your mouse and there you go. You can share with him every report and report ID um, that has been filled out over the last two months. And if he likes to, if he would like to get a little bit more granular with it, see what we were doing on January 2nd, we can show him that, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to overload him with information and just give him the, yeah. the one page report just to show him that we've been doing them. Alternatively, you could provide them access to log into your tenant and that individual could self-service themselves. Um, they would have the access to the reports and read only views uh, supported by the security model. So uh, that, that's a great point, uh, be able to provide the data and let them kind of run with it. So it takes a little bit of burden off of you in terms of being able to uh, provide maybe folders or binders full of uh, printed paperwork. Correct. All right, so we've got a uh, slightly larger template here. This is actually split out over two different slides. Uh, so maybe we can talk about this uh, a little bit from kind of a uh, purpose standpoint, but then maybe we can break down a couple of the different sections here together. Um, so your incident investigation report template, uh, these are, again, first three pages here. Maybe just a, a quick aside from you, Cole, on you know, what's the importance of uh, following up on an incident. So tying in with the utility um, incidents, the utility damage, um, if, if we're filling one of these out in the field, uh, something's happened that shouldn't have, and we need to know why. Uh, most of the time, that thing costs something, and we want to know how much. So the intent of the incident investigation report is really to just gather all of the who, what, where, and whys mm -hmm. um, that, that take place with an incident. Um, a lot of incidents in site work are property damage and insurance comes into play when you're doing those. And they like to see good reporting with that as well. Um, with the incident report, we don't leave anything to assumption. We give them options to choose from and if they don't like our options, they can add in their own um, and tell us what was different about the options that we provided them. Um, but we are always going to get definitive feedback, I guess I should say. Um, there's, there's no assuming what happened once this is filled out. You, you will know all of the details. Sure. And over time, I would imagine this is an example of a template that from a design standpoint 
may require ongoing uh, maintenance, if you will, where perhaps there's certain pieces of information that become, you know, need to have when they were formerly kind of nice to have. Uh, what do you think? Is this one of those type of templates that you see yourself kind of working and tinkering on and, and never really being fully complete because it's, it's something that can grow with your organization? I would say that most of our templates fall under that um, category where we could always improve what we're putting into the field as a as an informed product because if we continually improve the questions that we're asking in these forms mm -hmm. um, we're only going to get better feedback so um, from a template and report design standpoint um, it's you give me a different perspective on um, how you ask certain questions. Um, you you can ask a question two different ways and get two completely different answers. And sure. um, you, you really have to think about how you're asking these questions um, to get the best information out of your reports. So. Right. And I, uh, I kind of bring that up because that's been part of our dialogue uh, I think kind of on and off for the last year as, uh, as your organization's been ramping up usage of B2W Inform, uh, you've been very receptive to some of the kind of best practice design standpoint um, pieces of feedback I've given you. And, you know, we've had some good dialogue about, you know, asking one question two different ways can produce two different results. So kind of thinking through that and, uh, and these templates and the system here can accommodate that kind of ongoing uh, development and design. So uh, just a kind of a, a side piece that I wanted to touch on and, and these being the, uh, the final three pieces too. So again, this is an interesting template because you're going to be collecting information and soliciting information from multiple sources. So here we can see the final page has got multiple electronic signature sign-offs. Um, do you find it helpful to be able to move kind of around, you know, with a iPad and this digital report and, and solicit signatures and capture witness statements uh, as opposed to maybe multiple paper copies that may or may not be fixed and reside in multiple locations? I certainly think there is a benefit to that, um, as you touched on with multiple sheets of paper. Um, when you fill out, when we fill out this incident report, I guess I should say, um, we, we usually don't go back and edit. We try to capture all the information as soon as we can. It's fresh in everyone's mind and you get the accurate details now instead of next week when you forgot to interview the, the witness and you get his statement on a piece of notebook paper and then it forgets to make its way into the file. So sure. um, with these uh, multiple sign off sections, you know that you know that more than one person is seeing this form. They are aware of the information that is put into it. And the email triggers that we have set up um, are really kind of informative to the project management side without over informing. If we have a little door ding, we're still going to fill an incident report out on it, but it's not something that we really need to investigate further or bug management about. So we do have the option um, when the severity of the incident calls for it to immediately notify project management and we can start getting our heads together immediately on what went wrong, mm -hmm. why we did it and what needs to be fixed. And that's, that's a great transition here because I wanted to talk a little bit about communication, right? These trigger points that we can build into these templates. So um, in this particular example, you, you've got two triggers. Uh, one for whether or not there was a cost associated with that incident and one for whether or not we're going to send a notification to your project management. Uh, talk to me just really quickly about setting up these triggers that lead into alerts in B2W Inform. Uh, 
this is the, the screenshot of, of your alert and, and your trigger point from project management. So maybe just talk me through you know, what the expectation is uh, in this alert design. So as I briefly touched on, um, we don't want to send every incident report um, to, you know, on blast to the project management team. Uh, we leave it up to our safety director to inform him or inform them of the um, severe ones, the ones that we need to talk about immediately. Um, and with the alert set up here, um, it's, it's extremely easy to set these alerts up um, to go out to your informed tenant, your email, text message, however you form you'd like to see that sent in, it's easy to set it up. I believe this one works off of a, uh, essentially a true false uh, statement. Is the box checked? Is it not? When the box gets checked, it sends an email out and it's it's really about as easy as, as you can get with an alert. Right. And, and most of the alerts in, in form are set up very similar to that. It's, it's usually a logic based answer or numeric. Is this number higher than this? Is this number lower than that? Send an alert. Don't send an alert. Sure. And um, it just, and it makes disseminating information really easy and customizable. Mm -hmm. You don't have to ask people to go look for information that's on inform your you're giving it to them to look at, so. And the recipients for this communication, they don't necessarily have to be employees of Tui House Excavating or licensed inform users, do they? Correct. Um, we have not done this yet, but if for say a contractor that we were working with, um, uh, say a general contractor wanted to be notified of any incident that occurred on site, we could have include him as a uh, non-B2W user in a special alert for a project specific template. And if there was an incident report filled out or utility damage or a confined space permit uh, mm -hmm. filled out, we could let him know and customize those um, sending options based on what we need at the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. Finally, a uh, quick piece here on reporting, uh, slightly different view than what we'd looked at before. So from a dashboard reporting perspective, uh, what, what do you like about this, this display here? Uh, talk to me about the, the data and, and what do you think is, is useful here in this type of report? I like everything about this dashboard. Uh, this, this is an awesome visual tool to people who don't want to dive into the nitty gritty details of all the reports. Um, this, is a, this is a great overview tool um, that we actually just implemented in our annual safety meeting mm -hmm. last Friday. Any incident that we fill out um, has a it's incident type um, field and by clicking the incident type at the top of this uh, dashboard, you can see any incident that was filled out for that incident type over the course of a set time period, which you have the option of customizing as well. It shows you the incident frequency for the year, uh, the time period at which the incident occurred and uh, who was involved, where it happened, Mm -hmm. And it's it's it shouldn't be so smart. It really shouldn't. Uh, but it it makes information easy to pull up um, just with the click of a button. Heads up display. That's that's probably the uh, aspect I like most about the dashboard reports. Just uh, in a quick snapshot, you can look at trends over time. You can look at uh, you know aggregated types of incidents. Uh, I I really enjoy this one as well. So. Okay, and as we're starting to kind of wind down here with uh, you know the last eight minutes or so in our session, um, I kind of kept what I'm thinking best for last uh, with you because equipment inspection reports have been one of the longest running use cases uh, for your organization. So uh, 
as we get into the, the last use case here, maybe just uh, quickly talk to me about what does it look like for equipment inspections at uh, Tui House Excavating? So prior to uh, using Inform for our equipment inspections, um, we were we were going to Staples and buying the uh, tear off sheets of customizable um, reports, and um, they may get they may have got filled out. They may not have been filled out. Um, if they did get filled out, sometimes they rode around in the truck for two months before they got turned in and that entire time the superintendent may have been complaining about the broken windshield or something small that just wasn't getting fixed. Lo and behold, the reports never got to our service manager to be fixed. So, so with these equipment service reports, uh, we've got them set up to group off of our equipment numbers. Um, you, you have to select the piece of equipment that you're inspecting before you begin the report. We have our report cut down about as much as we can, try to include all of the normal wear and tear and inspection items um, that you would encounter on any one of our pieces of equipment or trucks or trailers um, and, and really made this form all inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, the safety equipment is generally, there are a few items in there that I don't think would count, but um, these are our Imshaw quarry items to not be cited in a quarry. You have to make sure you're inspecting those. And and uh, it was nice to include that in a little separate section on the form just to get the guys thinking, hey, this is actually really important. If we're working in this area, we need to be looking at these um, every time we're filling out a report. Mm -hmm. We have our report set up to record hours, mileage, and uh, rock drill hammer hours. We can report on all of them at once if we want to. We can report on just one of them. And with the uh, reporting on the back end of this, we have the ability to run uh, mileage and hours reports, which help our service techs um, with just regular, regularly scheduled oil changes and maybe tire rotations, something as simple as that. And we also have our um, equipment inspection report that notes um, when certain things and items need repair. And with the help of Jeremy, we have this designed in a way that the report condenses all of the inspection items into one green box that basically means you're good to go. That equipment doesn't need anything on safety equipment or normal wear and tear uh, inspection items. How it notifies us of problems is if there's a box check next to an item that says repair, it flags that, it comes up red in the report, and it only lists that item that needs repair on that machine. So from a reporting standpoint on the back end, um, our service managers don't have to sift through uh, 60 service reports and go down the list on every one of those to make sure nothing was wrong and possibly miss things that were wrong. Um, with this report that we have set up, um, set up scheduled uh, weekly every Friday, uh, they can open their email, scroll through three pages of PDFs, and as long as they're not seeing any red, they know that they're good. They incredible time-saving tool for all of them and it, it really cuts down on paperwork which they don't need to be bothered with it, it, it gets them focused on the one thing that they need to be fixing per piece of equipment and get about their day so now i i like it uh i work conditional formatting into as many reports as possible because a lot of times there's there's form data that you know we're not particularly interested in if if everything's checked out through the inspection i can't say your equipment manager is probably too concerned about that piece of equipment but uh yes definitely through uh conditional formatting let's highlight those those little hot spots if you will in in some of these forms and, and let's call attention to those specifically so uh, i'm glad you were able to work in too that you've got this as a uh, scheduled report because i know that 
you have several different types of reports scheduled in your tenant. So nice way to uh, work schedule reporting in as well. So. Okay, so uh, as we're winding down on time here, just the last uh, few minutes, thinking through these different use cases, uh, what you've been able to share with us uh, so far, Cole, and kind of what I shared from kind of a template design and reporting standpoint, um, just take a, a minute or two here to kind of run through maybe some of these takeaways uh, and, and circle back on, on some of the kind of bigger ideas here. So, we initially started with ease of use, uh, talked about your kind of traditional base processes and workflows. Um, one thing that we hadn't really specifically talked about was ease of conversion. So kind of moving from paper, translating those paper designs into templates in the system and then rolling that out and, and getting field users started working with the application with little to no training. Uh, that process itself, I mean, have, have you really encountered a lot of pushback? Has this been pretty easy transition for you, um, converting from paper to, to digital? You will have a little bit of pushback um, from, from older generations specific, specifically, excuse me. Um, but we are longtime B2W users. Um, we incorporated track uh, for our field logs just as we were buying licenses for inform mm -hmm. and uh, we held training for our superintendents uh, using using track and that was kind of an undertaking that was our first step into the electronic world and and i always tell the guys when i'm training them if you can fill out a field log in track you can fill out any form in inform it's it's not saying track is hard by any means, but inform is just crazy simple when it comes to that. So the the pushback that you get is, is I think you're just standard. I don't want to try new things type of pushback. It's not a complicated, I don't understand this type of push, mm -hmm. pushback. So the, uh, the conversion from paper to inform uh, has been pretty seamless really. We, as of January, have all 24 users um, set up with their licenses, and um, I did the training on that. I'm not much of a, a speaker, but I was able to convey how they needed to be using these forms and how to fill them out, and I don't have many phone calls on a day-to-day -day basis about it, so I think, I think we're right. succeeding where we need to be. Well, that, that's good to hear as we kind of wind down to the last few seconds. So uh, I want to thank you again, Cole, for taking the time to speak with me and all of the attendees here for, uh, for this discussion and this session. So thank you again. I know you've got a busy schedule. For those of you that joined in uh, today, appreciate the time. Thank you and take care. Thank you, Jeremy.